Hello, this is Kathleen Cooling of the St. Helena, California Historical Society. Welcome to our September 22, 2021 lecture. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's lecture, I'd like to give you a little preview of two coming attractions in the 2021 Suzanne Salvestren Memorial Lecture Series. Next month, which is October, is Italian and Italian Swiss Heritage Month. And Tony Quinn will be speaking on the first Swiss Italian immigrants in St. Helena. Mr. Quinn is a descendant of one of the historic Vintner families. And then in November, which is Native American Heritage Month, Mr. Clint McKay of the Pepperwood, Pepperwood Preserve will give a lecture on cultures, traditions, and history of Native Americans in the Napa Valley area. Mr. McKay holds a master's degree in indigen, indigenous education from Arizona State University and is a descendant of several important local culture bearers. The entire lecture series for 2021 will soon be available on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. Today, the St. Helena Historical Society is excited to present a new lecture in the series entitled Chinese Immigrants in the Napa Valley. Our speaker today is local historian, architectural historian, and Napa County Landmarks board member, Kara Brunzel. Kara's presentation will describe the establishment of Chinese communities in the Napa Valley in the mid 1800s and their contributions to the culture and economy of the Napa Valley in the face of hardship and intolerance. So welcome, Kara. I'll turn the meeting over to you. Hi, thank you for having me and it's a pleasure to be here. I only wish we could do it in person, but um, this is, you know, second best to doing things in person. And I'm, I'm really honored that the St. Helena Historical Society is, uh, is hosting me and allowing me to give this presentation about um, what I think is one of the most interesting aspects of local history. So, uh, this first slide shows a picture of St. Helena's Chinatown. And um, the Chinese, uh, according to do available documents, arrived in the Napa area about the same time as the early American settlers. Uh, Chinese immigrants were present at the foundation of Napa as an American town. And the first local historian, C.A. Menifee, who was also a newspaper editor, describes a diverse population in 1848 when Napa was uh, laid out as a very, very small village. He describes Native Americans, Black and white Americans from the East, and Australians standing, quote, cheek by jowl, with uh, Chinese immigrants in this tiny uh, new town. The story of the Chinese is an important part of local history and it has often been overlooked in part because of language barriers um, because we don't have a lot of local Chinese speakers. And uh, there are also some very ugly elements to this story. And I think that has made it something that people often prefer to look away from. I got interested in this topic when I was in graduate school and I performed primary source research focusing on the stories of the local Chinese community. And um, at that time, the only source I had was local newspapers, which um, this was about 15 years ago. So they were still all on microfilm. So it was quite labor intensive to do this research. And, and that research uh, kind of formed the, forms the basis for the talk I'm gonna give, um, but I have subsequently added in other research and, and found out other stories from other sources. So we're gonna, we're gonna mix it up a little bit. And um, unfortunately, I am not able to read Chinese and we don't have 
uh, local documents from the Chinese perspective. So keep in mind that you know the, the source documents are all from a single perspective. Okay, so um, just a little bit of the context that uh, that is the background for Chinese migration to Napa County. Um, as with migration today, global migration in the 19th century was driven by push and pull factors. Uh, the middle decades of the 1800s were particularly chaotic in China. Uh, many people are probably aware that the British waged two opium wars against the Chinese government, and those were wars uh, the British fought for their right to continue selling opium to Chinese residents, uh, the, and the Chinese government wanted to stop that because it was devastating their population, but the British wanted the revenue, so they fought two wars. And then there was also a Taiping rebellion that extended into a bloody civil war. So this engraving is shows an 1860 battle between Anglo-French uh, uh, armed military and Chinese forces, uh, and and just kind of is a, an example of what was going on in China. So so you can see the forces that push people out. Um, in addition to this violence, population growth had forced farmers onto smaller and smaller plots of land. And so the life of a Chinese peasant, which had you know, been a precarious one from time immemorial, became extremely difficult during this period. So many people fled China to avoid war and frankly, starvation. So California exerted pull on these folks with its image as a land of riches. And especially after the gold rush began in 1849, the Chinese referred to California as Gold Mountain. The earliest Chinese immigrants to California were almost all male, and most of them were also quite young, especially in the early years. Many were sojourners, by which I mean they hoped to make a fortune or just send enough home to allow their family to survive and uh, then return to China to marry or, you know, li live their golden years out at, in their, in, you know, in their homeland. And it was uh, surprisingly, given the distance and the difficulty of travel, actually quite common for Chinese migrants to make several trips back and forth to uh, California. And we have, we have examples of local Napa County residents who, who also made several trips back and forth. They would often go back to get married. And if they could, they would bring a wife back with them. Sometimes they had to leave the wife behind. And sometimes they wanted you know, children to receive some education in China. Um, so, during this period, Chinese immigrants did a huge amount of every type of labor that was um, difficult, basically. They worked as farmhands, at cigar rollers, building roads and railroads, and in mining, whether you know, on their own account, trying to strike it rich, or for um, you know, larger mines that were, were owned by um, investors. Many were employed as domestic servants and cooks, and those uh, servants tended to live in the house with the family they worked for. And there were also quite a few Chinese entrepreneurs and small businessmen. One of the most common Chinese-owned business was um, you know, the, the stereotypical Chinese laundry, uh, but there were also vegetable carts, grocery stores, and small farms operated by Chinese immigrants. So this engraving, uh, which was published by Harper's in 1878, shows an imagined scene of uh, wine country with Chinese and white laborers harvesting and crushing grapes in California. And this particular, uh, this particular image caused local controversy because uh, both because of the image of the Chinese, which was 
considered something, you know, negative to have Chinese workers. And of course the, you know, foot crushing, which even uh, at that early date was considered a little bit old fashioned and gross. Um, there was an editorial in the San Elena Star that actually accused Harper's of malice in printing this saying uh, the paper did its best to break down the wine interest of California with your fancy sketch of Chinamen treading out the wine with their feet. And here we have just a couple images of Chinese migrants working as miners in the Sierra Nevada and uh, Chinese laborers on a what, what I believe is a railroad embankment. And these are not local photographs, but I include them, you know, so you can see the type of costume and the, the conditions that they, they worked under and their, um, their numbers. So over the 1850s, um, the city of Napa began to be home to a, a Chinese community. Um, it, Napa's, Napa's Chinatown was on the peninsula that isn't really there anymore, but at the confluence of Napa, Napa River and Napa Creek, and that came to be known as China Point. And there's a plaque there today if you go on to the first street bridge, and there's that round China Gate. Those are um, basically all that's left of Napa's Chinatown. So um, by 1860, the overall population of the city of Napa had grown to over 2,300 and it, it, it had been just 159 people a decade before. So still a small town, but really, you know, remarkably fast growth. And at least 14, um, quote, Asiatics appear on the US census from that year. And this is a representative page that shows that um, there are there are Chinese who are living integrated with the local community. They're not. This is not a Chinatown because uh, census records are you know um, collected street by street. So this is a whole street of people, and it has three. Chinese laundry men living on it, and they're all between the ages of 21 and 30. And we see that they appear to be living in a boarding house with uh, several other men because they're all at the same address, um, you know, non Chinese men. And uh, another interesting thing about this particular census page is almost all the Chinese and white. Uh, residents on this page are uh, men, and uh, because in 1860, although there had been some growth, there hadn't been the type of infrastructure that would inspire women to move to Napa County, which, you know, women would start moving when there were, of course, substantial houses, you know, commercial areas with, um, you know, wood sidewalks would have been an important um, amenity. And then institutions like churches, schools, and of course, uh, cemeteries were important to make, make a community that would not just be a pioneer outpost. So Napa was very much in the, um, you know, the pioneer phase at this time. So Chinese entrepreneurs in Napa County advertised their businesses in local newspapers, including the Napa Register, the St. Helena Star, and you know, some other newspapers that no longer exist. Um, here are a sampling of these ads from the 1870s and 1880s. And they show us that in addition to laundries, uh, Chinese immigrants were operating general stores and acting as labor contractors. And we see Ginger, uh, this is obviously an American nickname, uh, who was un among the most influential people in the Chinese community. And he had you know, what was called a China store at the time, meaning a store that sold Chinese goods. It wasn't a place where you bought you know, China dishes. It was uh, imported goods from China. 
And this is the second page of advertisements. Another one for a China store wash house was what laundries were called during this era. And you know, you see offerings of labor contracting, groceries, and Chinese goods all under one roof. And the, that labor contractors offered wood chopping, grape picking, and general farm labor during this, this uh, era. And there were no Chinese language newspapers. So these Chinese businesses are obviously advertising to their uh, English speaking, you know, friends and neighbors. And they, you know, they probably would have advertised to one another by word of mouth and, um, you know, just simple signs on their businesses. Uh, Chinese farmers were working at this time, we know from newspaper stories, uh, speaking of entrepreneurs, and there were at least two farms in city limits in Napa, um, and there was a carp raising operation in the hills and also uh, strawberry growing somewhere near Angwin. And those, we know about these because they happen to have um, uh, newspaper stories. And I, I particularly love these uh, Mo Hing ads because they have this, um, you know, special type, which uh, you, if you know anything about typesetting, it must have been quite expensive and special to have that done. And I think it's really fun to see that kind of Chinese theme type. They must have specially asked for that. And I think it's really cool. Here is a photo that is unfortunately not very high resolution, but I like to include it because it's an 1880 photograph of a local grape harvest. And we can see um, that there are Chinese workers and apparently integrated with um, you know, white workers as, as far as we can tell. Um, other local industries that relied on the Chinese included hop growing, quicksilver mines, and of course, winery and wine cave construction and uh, stone, stone wall construction. But much of that work was done by Chinese laborers, especially in the early decades. And as wine production accelerated in the 1880s, uh, growers increasingly relied on Chinese labor. Um, they were considered more dependable than other workers. And if there weren't enough living locally, Chinese workers could travel from San Francisco, which of course had you know, a much larger Chinatown than any, any of those in um, Napa Valley. And they were, of course, willing to do the difficult picking work. At that time, a, a lot of grape clusters were low to the ground. So it would have been, you know, stoop work that was very hard on the body. They were willing to do it. And uh, William Heights, the, the wine historian, uh, says that they were also preferred in this era as seller employees uh, because apparently they were less likely to drink. So. Many Chinese worked in remote parts of the valley because they worked in the fields and the mines. And a lot of those were, you know, up valley, up in the hills, um, more remote places. And in all likelihood, they were undercounted in census records. Uh, of course, they, you know, they were immigrants and a lot of them didn't speak good English. They also would probably have avoided the census takers. So, you know, we don't have perfect numbers for sure. But by 1870, there were at least 143 Chinese in the city of Napa, and the Chinatown was really forming as its own neighborhood. And it also grew by at least 100 over the following decade. And um, here we have a photograph taken by a local photographer, M.H. Strong, of a building in in Napa's Chinatown and with these um, young men, you know, relaxing out front um, and they seem to be wearing, wearing their best clothes and uh, it may be, you know, Chinese New Year or another holiday. Here is the Sanborn map uh, that show, showing China Point in Napa um, and the, you know, Napa Creek across the bottom of the um, image. And then this is the main part of Chinatown. And over on the left, 
Um, some sources have in, indicated that this was also part of Chinatown. It, it's kind of hard to picture where it was. Um, the, the bridge was so much smaller than the current bridge that, you know, it's where it is now is basically in the river. Um, it, it's you look down on it from the bridge, but at this time the bridge was small. And so right when you came over the bridge, you know, Chinatown was on both sides. But these were, you know, this wasn't the most attractive land because it flooded frequently and that's how the Chinese ended up there. Um, so by the time this map was created in 1886, we can see we have multiple dwellings, um, at least one wash house, you know, laundry, uh, and a Chinese temple, which is labeled uh, Joss House. Uh, if you can read it, it's over here on the right. And um, so the, the altar for that temple supposedly came very early on, I believe in the 1860s from China with uh, members of the Chan family who were one of the you know, longest, uh, longest tenured Chinese residents in uh, the city of Napa. So the St. Helena Chinatown was supposedly even bigger. And um, I, I've read estimates that at its peak, it was um, 600, as many as 600 residents. Here we, here we have uh, 1899 Sanborn map, you know, it's, there's no way 600 people could have lived right here, but um, yeah, I don't know, you know, where they all, where they all would have been, but it's, you can see it's almost as big in terms of buildings as, uh, as the Napa Chinatown, and it does, it doesn't have a temple, but it has, you know, what appear to be dwellings and a laundry and, you know, maybe, maybe a store, and it's right it's located right on Main Street, just south of where Gotts is now. And the where the buildings are is right about where West Charter Oak goes, goes through now. So Cal Sogan Rutherford also had Chinatowns and I was looking at census records and there were you know, pages of Chinese residents in, um, in Rutherford in his surprising numbers. You know, I think it was in the 1880s. Um, which seems to have been about the peak. And then this is a later, I think this one is from 1910. And it's very frustrating to me because it is basically cut off at, you know, Main Street and they don't, they don't show anything. It's, you know, it's turned the other way. So um, this is, you know, west of Main Street and just labeled Chinatown, but um, we don't know exactly what was left there. Um, in 1910 and 1944, it's shown the same way. So, so here are a few census records uh, from St. Helena, Hot Springs Township, which was, you know, how, how St. Helena always appeared on early census records. Um, some, I, I just include all of them to show you how many pages there are of, of Chinese residents and there aren't really addresses so we don't know exactly but this concentration suggests they would have been in Chinatown, you know, probably in, in that area we saw on the last slide. Uh, one thing that I found interesting that I've never seen on uh, census records is they just wrote name unknown over here on the left across, you know, 15. And they just apparently couldn't be bothered to ask them their names. They, they did it. They asked them their, you know, they asked them their ages and their occupations. And then they asked these other men, they're, they're I think all men during this era, um, but they, you know, I don't know, they got sick of it or they couldn't understand what they were saying. So it just kind of shows the, um, you know, the, the all the communities had connecting. Um, and so interesting that during this era, so this is 1870, none of these men report an occupation like merchant or proprietor. Almost all are laborers, you know, meaning basically day laborers most of the time. And um, 
they are also all between the ages of about 15 or 16 and 33, I think is the very oldest, you know, late, late teens to um, 30s. They're, they're basically all young men. And that began, began to change over time. So these are some of the artifacts uh, St. Helena Historical Society has in its collection. Miriam Hansen was kind enough to get these out and show them to me. And I think they're really um, fun to look at, especially, you know, they, they give us some more, you know, sense of the tactile than some of these dusty documents that are exciting for historians, but might be harder for um, the general interest public to look at. Now, I, Mary might know more than when I was there last, but we didn't know the exact provenance. I believe these must be uh, reproductions because just because of the materials, I don't think it's the kind of thing that lasts for a hundred years, so, um, but they appear to be really faithful reproductions and it shows the, you know, the practical kind of paths they were to, to keep the sun off their heads while they were doing this labor out, um, out in the world. And here we have another census record. This one is from 1880. And um, this one had another thing I had never seen. And I've looked at, I've probably looked at thousands of pages of census records over the years in my work. And it has this, uh, I don't know if it's readable over the, um, on the screen, but it says here, um, cause they, you know, when people live together in uh, the census records say, you know, there's the head of household and then wife, son, boarder, everyone's, everyone's relationship with the head of household. And if it's, you know, the head is a mother, you know, it's the same thing. And so these, it says impossible to get relationship of Chinese. They report themselves all brothers or cousins. So, you know, I don't know if they couldn't be bothered um, or if they just were um, kind of flummoxed or if the Chinese really didn't, didn't care to reveal too much. You know, there was a whole tradition of paper sons and daughters later where people would, um, especially after a lot of documents were lost in, in fires in the San Francisco earthquake, people would come over and say they were somebody's son and they weren't necessarily, but they would use that to, to uh, immigrate to the US. So here's a few images. Um, the A.E. Burbank sketch of Chinatown from around 1929. And then um, on the lower left, we have a 1907 picture um, that I just love because this guy isn't posing, you know, it's kind of a candid shot. And, the, and it, we have so few images of the Chinese. And um, this is probably the only candid or one of the very few candids. And this is from the St. Helena Chinatown. I, you know, I, it's very intriguing. There's these gentlemen standing in the background. I don't really know what's going on, but um, you can kind of see it must be winter. He's got multiple layers on and is kind of mixing traditional. He's got the traditional Chinese jacket, but it looks like he has a heavy wool sweater underneath and kind of a newsboy style cap. And then on the right is a more formal portrait of a man who I usually see called Ah Hing. He was a cook for the Lyman family, the, the uh, William Lyman family who, um, who lived um, south of Bale Mill, I believe. And he worked for the family for 35 years. And according to the recollections of the children who grew up in the house, he was you know, much more than a cook. He was basically in charge of the household and he, his duties included things like making the children sit down and do their homework. So he was really, you know, indispensable to that family for many decades. And unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of information about him personally. Um, so now we get to so the sort of more difficult part of this story, which is the anti-Chinese movement, which was 
widespread in the US uh, during the 1870s and 1880s and was especially strong in California where we had a very large number of Chinese immigrants compared to other states. So um, the 19th century was an era of zero sum politics and most people in the US would have subscribed to the idea that whites could not thrive if people of color were also doing well. And so, you know, this rhetoric fueled this anti-Chinese anti uh, political movement. And, and they used this pro-labor language as a justification for attempting to drive the Chinese out of the US. And the populist sentiment of the day held that Chinese immigrants hurt the economy because they were willing to work for lower wages than most white Americans, and because they sent most or some of their earnings to China. So this virulent anti-Chinese movement arose nationwide with you know, many enthusiastic adherents in California and locally. And these images, these are, you know, were disseminated by local by national magazines. So these weren't produced locally, but this would have been the kind of media environment that people were, you know, marinating in at this time and affected people's views. So, you know, you see the, the coming man is one of the most famous. Um, and there are books about Chinese history with that title. The Com coming man was kind of 19th century how how someone up and coming was subscribed was described and so this is kind of trying to scare people that you know they're going to be replaced by the Chinese and you see this Chinese monopoly on all these um, businesses you know laundry cigar making um, clothing factories and then you know some other the the uh, the Chinese in the the top right is about to murder the uh, leather worker. Um, and it's, you know, rhet a rhetorical murder, or I guess a, a professional murder because he's gonna undercut him by making leather at a cheaper price. So, you know, uh, you, you see this, uh, and we'll, let me move on to some of the, um, some of the local iterations of that. Um, but before I do that, I'll show this slide, which is some more local portraits. And I, I just like to contrast this with the nasty cartoon images because I, I really like the, um, the dignity and poise of these men. You know, they're, they're, they're probably Chinese New Year portraits because they're dressed up in their best clothes and they're, you know, they're holding these fans and pose formally um, the one on the left, you know, it's, it's labeled St. Helena. It's, I suspect it's from around the 1880s. And the one on the right is, um, is taken at the Tubbs mansion. And, um, I, I think these two men, you know, worked in a Tubbs household up in Calistoga, but I haven't yet found out too much about them personally. But the one on the left, I've seen reproduced a lot. It's a pretty, pretty famous image, actually. So, um, you know, this is kind of like the dignity and poise that that these guys exhibited. And then here is some of the um, local <coughs> rhetoric. So, the, really, the anti-Chinese movement really got going in 1877 when the Workingmen's Party of California was organized after some anti-Chinese riots in San Francisco. And it was led by an Irish immigrant named Dennis Kearney. And they actually put forth elections, candidates for you know, the 1878 election and elected one third of the representatives to the convention that would form California's new constitution. So they really you know, had a significant political footprint and they, this, this party did embrace violent tactics to drive the Chinese out. And moderates at this time, you know, you didn't see a lot of people saying, you know, leave them alone, we need them, we need the workers. The moderates would, would advocate boycotts and um, to, to get, you know, get the Chinese to leave. Um, 
Kearney came to Napa for a workingman's picnic in 1878, and it was attended by, you know, I'm, I'm sure many people in Napa, I know many of these things were held at the hotels in Napa, as well as at the Opera House. There were several um, anti-Chinese meetings there. And the group of uh, St. Helena residents, like-minded anti-Chinese residents, traveled down in a conveyance that had a Chinese must-go sign on it. And, um, you know, the, our newspapers were obviously a forum for these debates and they printed, you know, opinion pieces about, you know, how the, the China, we couldn't coexist with the Chinese, um, you know, famous founders like Sam Brannan and, and um, Charles Krug made statements, you know, deploring Chinese immigration. And then you have this kind of advertising, this on, on the right, this, um, you know, Napa shoemaker is uh, saying, look, I don't hire, you know, buy my shoes because I don't hire Chinese. They're white made shoes. And that was a way people would advertise. And um, one funny thing about this is that they would, you know, people would, rally against Chinese owned businesses, they would open white laundries, you know, French laundry, that's probably, you know, another name for white laundry, uh, to let people know that it wasn't, you know, Chinese owned and operated. And they typically uh, quickly went out of business because, you know, cigar rolling, clothes washing, these are difficult, labor intensive, uh, chores and the, you know, when white people opened their own businesses, a lot of times they just couldn't compete on price and they would, they would go out of business. So, um, but, you know, they, they still, they, they certainly tried. Um, yeah, this is a, you know, two, two branches of a, a St. Helena and Rutherford white laundry. So that's some of the the rhetoric of boycott and exclusion. So um, one would think seeing those cartoons and ads that it was total war between the communities and they just, you know, it was just utter hatred, but it really was much more complex and nuanced than that. Um, and Chinese New Year's is one of the um, places where there was some overlap between the communities and, and some real fascination on the part of white Americans with Chinese customs and society. And, um, you know, Chinese funerals were also sometimes attended by Americans and um, they, they were at times invited to Chinese New Year celebrations and participated in the feasting um, offerings to the gods, debt settling, gift giving, and wearing new clothes were all part of Chinese traditions. And there are many, many stories in the Napa papers of, you know, an impoverished or, you know, someone with not very, not very wealthy Chinese man giving gifts to his white friends on Chinese New Year's, you know, giving candy or cigars, passing them out. And, you know, passing them out to policemen. And of course, Chinese uh, merchants uh, competed with each other to have the biggest fireworks display. And, um, you know, in a pre-internet, pre-television, and even pre-radio of uh, Napa Valley, those fireworks displays were, you know, really precious to Napa County children. And they, they uh, waited for them with great excitement. Uh, this is a picture of the Joss house in, uh, that was in the Napa Chinatown. And it's just one of my favorite uh, local photos because it, it shows a family group. Um, and there's actually a, what looks to me like a female child in the middle holding the baby. And I have not been able to find any other pictures of, um, you know, Chinese, well, very few pictures. I have, I've seen a couple, but no Chinese women from the 19th century. And this was supposedly um, 
February 19, 1896, according to Shuck Chan, who was the, um, the son, I think this is uh, Wa Jack Chan, oops, and that Shuck Chan was his son. And Wa Jack Chan was one of the earliest residents. Um, he may have been here at, at, as early as 1860 and was one of Napa Chinatown's earliest uh, merchants. And Shuck Chan was supposedly born in, um, in China about 1895 when his parents were going back and forth. And uh, his, his mother, this, this man's wife, was, um, was actually American born. She was from uh, gold country and was, was born and raised in, in the US. So, um, and the, Ch the Chan family is one of the most interesting families and one of the longest tenured in Napa County to my knowledge, um, because they, uh, Ging Chan just died a couple of years ago and he was still living in the city of Napa and he would have been this man's grandson, I believe. So, um, and I have a lot more about the, um, this family that I included in my Napa oriented presentation, but um, I'm gonna move on to some St. Lena related things. Um, this is something I just found, um, which was a, um, an article about a um, woman who was arrested and she said she was the four, you know 22 year old fourth wife of Tong Tai Singh of Rutherford and um, she was detained at Angel Island and I, I couldn't figure out how this was eventually you know decided but but the same thing actually happened to Shuck Chan's wife um, and she was detained at Angel Island, even though, you know, Chuck Chan was, you know, and the, the, these is, this is in the 20th century. These, these detentions are happening like in the 1920s. Um, so it was, you know, there was still a lot going on making life hard for Chinese. And this is, you know, they really didn't want um, the US government and anti-Chinese forces really didn't want Chinese women to come because then you know, the family would settle permanently. So um, I really have worked very hard to try to find some personal stories about the Chinese and, you know, learn about their biographies. It's very, very difficult. But um, I did find a few tidbits about this man. Um, and I wanted to share them because, I, you know, I think he's kind of emblematic in some ways, but also um, unusual in the, the length of time he stayed and the fact that he was here well into the 20th century. Because by the turn of the century, the exclusionary laws, boycotts, the violence, and then competition with waves of, you know, Italian and German and other immigrants, uh, were had lowered the numbers of Chinese locally and the Chinatowns had gotten much smaller. And then, you know, people also just never planned to stay forever in the US. So just went back to their homeland. So the population was definitely declining by the turn of the century. And this is a local Chinese resident who stuck it out for many years. And he was known as Charlie Gluyas. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that name, but Miriam can um, probably tell me later because that was a pretty prominent family. I believe his legal name was Jung Tan or Young Tan, but he appears in different guises in different um, you know, census forms. So it's hard to tell, you know, especially since the census takers would have been white Americans that are just kind of guessing how to, you know, write a Chinese name, even transliterating it into English. 
So he seems to have been born in Canton, like, like most immigrants in this era, about 1850, and came to the U.S. between the mid-1860s and 1879. And, and that's the year he appears in a short piece in the Star um, that in January 1879, explaining that he was already working for the Blue Yas family, and he was doing something with a pistol and he shattered the middle finger of his left hand um, in a, a gun accident. And he, he worked from that same family from 1879 until at some, some, some sources say 37 years, uh, but at least till 1906. And after his elderly boss, Helen Kulias died, he had to move on and work as a cook. He was getting old himself, but he worked as a cook for three more families until um, the 1920s. By 1920, he was working in um, it for the Everett family in Rutherford. And he finally decided to um, return to China in 1922. And there was this quite nice article about, you know, how he's kind of a beloved local figure. And um, there, I, I wasn't able to find a lot about him. There is this photo that um, I'm not sure when it was taken. I suspect it's around the turn of the century because he seems middle-aged and because the bicycle is a more modern style of bicycle and he probably wouldn't have had the newest type of bicycle. So I'm thinking 1890s on this photo, but um, don't know for sure. Um, this is part of the St. Helena Historical Society collection. And you know, you can see he's wearing Western clothes and a um, straw boater hat. And uh, I, I found a, another tidbit or two about him, one about him giving a uh, Chinese lily as a uh, Chinese New Year gift to a local person. And then he won a prize for his jelly at the 1914 Vintage Festival. And then uh, he also was praised in the newspaper for the arrangements he made for his employer's 88th birthday. Um, so that is what I know about this man. And, and he supposedly returned to China in 1922. And I would love to find out, you know, how long he lived, what happened to him when he returned. I don't think he had any children, but you never know. Sometimes these guys went back and forth a few times and had families in China. So um, I would love to know more about him. Okay, so this is the last real slide I have prepared. And this... Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of local people or people who have visited here are familiar with the Vintners Collective building on Main Street in Napa. It has been, um, you know, a tasting room for at least 15 years. And to my knowledge, it is the only building in the county that had a long historic association with a Chinese business. And this was the Sam Key Laundry for at least 50 years. So Sam Key was another longtime resident, but um, in the 19th century, and we don't know as much about him. He was born in China about 1849, and by 1879 had opened a laundry on Main Street in Napa. Uh, and that, that location had previously housed the laundry for 12 years, but in 1887, after it had been there for 20 years and he had operated for eight years, the Napa City Council passed an ordinance declaring that a laundry located on Main Street between First and Pearl was a nuisance and illegal. And they came and arrested him and his employees. And I think this is really impressive because he appealed through the courts and um, 
the district court under Judge Lorenzo Sawyer, who, who I, I was looking him up today, and he a actually gave a similar decision for um, a case that was based in Stockton and said, no, this business is not a nuisance. Every person has a right to try to work to sustain himself, whether they're you know, native born or an immigrant. And this law was obviously passed just to harass him. And so, you know, he was, he was allowed to continue. And I guess he got out of jail, you know, his laundry. And then um, not to be outdone in 1897, St. Helena denied him a permit to open a new laundry on Pope Street near the railroad tracks. And they also cited a new city ordinance. So by the 20s, 1920s, he had moved into this building. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's the same Sam Key or if they just kept the name because that, you know, by that time he would have been about 70. Um, so, uh, but the, the interesting thing about this building is that it remained a Chinese laundry um, well into the 20th century, in fact, until about 1980. And it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1974. That's when, you know, Napa City Council was trying to raise every historic building. And it was still, you know, still Chinese laundry at that time. And the, this ad on the, the right is from that era. And this is a, there's a great spread in the Napa Register from this era. And the, um, these four little girls, it was, it was operated by the Wong family at this time. And, you know, the, the, even though there's a continuity of the business, these are new immigrants. Again, the, the kids were either born here or came here when they were very young and they were quite Americanized, but the um, parents, the father didn't speak great English. And so he kept going with this laundry after, you know, most people had a, a, a washing machine at home by 1980. And so he was just basically, he says in the article from the seventies that he's still just serving, you know, he's just down to just old people who don't want to change their ways. Um, so that I think is kind of a, it's kind of an exciting story to that kind of brings this, brings a, some continuity to the present day. And I've, I've made an effort. I believe the um, the oldest daughter is about my age, and I've made an effort to find her and see if we could get her to because she's she's done she's written some memoirs about growing up and going to school here when you know there were very few Chinese people in the seventies and eighties and what that was like. But she's her her name is May Wong, so that's a fairly common name. So I haven't been able to find her, but I would be. You know, I'm very interested in talking to members, you know, descendants of some of these families and getting some more of the personal stories into this. Okay, that is the last slide I have set up for you, but I am um, available to answer questions and, um, you know, chat about anything you want to chat about. Well, thank you, Kara, for that great presentation. It's uh, it's just been so enjoyable to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, I it seems like you should be able to find some of these descendants. Um, you know, if you, you know, if 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 you could put it out there in a general way, you know, that you're looking for these kind of things, it would be so um enlightening i think to to get some of these stories about the families from from their perspective as to you know really what it was like yeah um actually when we did this through the napa library i talked about the chan family at more length um and there were some members of that family you know cousins and distant relatives that that came and they had 
you know, they have more, more, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, do you have a picture of my grandma or whatever? And they, you know, they want, they want more from me, but um, yeah, it would be really interesting to, um, to have a back and forth with, uh, with some of the descendants. Um, I have another question um, in the, the Chinatowns of both Napa and St. Helena, about how long were they in existence? Okay, well, I don't know the answer in, in St. Helena, but I do know, so some sources, I haven't seen a primary source that dates the start of Napa Chinatown, but I've seen like newspaper stories from, you know, the 50s and 60s that date it to 1847, which would really be early, but, you know, not, not impossible. Um, but it was, you know, it was definitely there by 1860, I would say, or at least, you know, a kernel of it was there. And, and the Napa um, Chinatown was, the Chan family actually held on and Shuck Chan had a store down there for, um, with his mother after his father's death in the early 20th century. And it's really interesting because by this time, um, Shuck Chan and his mother were considered, you know, the rhetoric completely changed. And when they're in the paper, they're like, pioneer Chinese resident, you know, Mrs. Jack Chan and her son Chuck, and they talked about them in kind of glowing terms. But of course, you know, people knew them personally, and you, you know how it goes with prejudice, like people that have animosity or prejudice often don't extend it to people they know personally. And um, they actually, in 1979, the, the Napa County Historical Society had a Shuck Chan Day and um, you know, celebrated them, but it's redevelopment and uh, okay, so when one of the streets was pushed through, I think they had to relocate their store and that was in the early 20th century. And then in the, um, in 1930, under the direction of Napa Mayor uh, Trower, the first, the first Mayor Trower, Charles Trower, this group decided to clean up the Napa River and they, and what they meant by that was demolish Chinatown. And they said that they were going to build a yacht club, um, you know, right, right there in the, at the confluence of the creek and the river. And they got, I, I think they must have paid something decent because the Chan family went along with it and didn't at least publicly complain in the newspaper. So I think they must have, you know, paid them something. And they just demolished what was left in 1930. And then, of course, you may be shocked to learn that the um, the Chinatown, um, the the yacht club never materialized, you know. So, so that was that was that. But um, the Chans stayed, you know, stayed around. They went back and forth. They moved to the foothills and had a Chinese restaurant. But then they came back and lived on Elm Street by Shearer School. And then um, Ging Chan. Uh, worked at Mara. I think he was an accountant. I, I talked to him once about 10 years ago, and he lived here mostly his whole life. And he, you know, he only died, I think he died in 2020. And he and his wife both died. And he was, he had a different career that wasn't related to preservation or history or anything, but he was instrumental in restoring the Winship building, which is the building at the um, intersection of Main and First where um, Napa Valley Coffee is. And it, um, you know, it was, it has the tower, it's like the last building in Napa with the Victorian style tower. 
and that had been taken off and, and he was part of a group that restored that. So um, it's a very interesting local family, you know. Miriam, any questions from you? <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, while you mentioned the destruction of the Chinatown in Napa, um, I was in the Chinese Historical Society of America's Museum in San Francisco and saw the Joss House that came from Napa. So I'd be interested to know, you know, when it was destroyed in 1930, did somebody just save the Joss House and send it off to- Yes, and you know what, I have some slides in my um, other presentation, which there's no real reason I didn't include them. I was just trying to make the content a little, um, a little unique and different in case we had, um, you know, people who, um, who wanted to participate. I'm gonna. I think I'll share my screen again if that's okay. Uh oh, where did the Zoom call go? Um, because I think you might be interested in in this, um, okay, to share. These are, um, there's a few slides that are just related to the Chan family. So I can just, we can just have these on in the background. Um, this is, uh, I think this is Ying Chan right here. And this is, you know, their, their, uh, their holiday card um, from, I, I don't know when, uh, maybe 1940 or something. So, um, and then this is a picture of Shuck Chan. And these are some things that were recovered from the, um, their buildings when Chinatown was destroyed, including this is a whole booklet that his wife was studying for her citizenship. He, she made these notes in, um, in Chinese, and then she made other notes in, you know, she filled in the sheriff of the country is Earl Randall, and, you know, somewhere else is the governor is Ronald Reagan, you know, so it's just really kind of precious things, you know, that the Chan family donated to the Napa Historical Society, and I'm getting to your question, Miriam, about the, the uh, Joss house, and then this, these are some of the artifacts from Chuck Chan Day, when they, when they have that in, and that was, uh, yeah, E. Clampus Vitus. I'm sure you know who they are. Uh, Shuck Chan was a clamper. He lived up in the uh, Sierras for a while and he was very involved with uh, E. Clampus Vitus and they, they, I think, spurred this. But this is, this, this is a huge button. It's about like that big, it's really cool. Um, so here is, the, the rededication of the Joss House. So the, um, the Chan family, and I think they were smart to do so after their experiences in Napa, donated it to the Chinese Historical Society. And I think it may have been one of the first real artifacts and kind of spurred the formation of the Chinese Historical Society in Napa or in San Francisco. Um, and so these photos are um, Lee Kum Chan and Shuck Chan, you know, at the celebration for, uh, for the, the rededication, because I, you know, I, I don't, I think it's a Taoist temple. I, I've never, I tried to find out from, you know, people who would know, but I haven't, you know, I've seen it in, local documents called the Taoist temple, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, it could- Well, it's it's really the centerpiece of their museum. They It's the only one they have. Yeah, it's, it's really special. Oh. Supposedly, um, Chan, uh, Jack, I think his name was like Chuck Chan, Chuck Chan's father. And he went by Wa Jack Chan or Jack Chan. And supposedly he brought that over in a ship and um, in the 1860s. So, you know, it's, it's really old and yeah, it's really neat. And so do they still have it displayed? Cause I feel like I went there, I called them and asked them about it and they said they have it, but it was put away or something. You actually saw- oh, I haven't, I haven't been there in, in well, five years or more so. Okay, well, 
it wasn't that long ago. It was probably longer than that. I don't know. I my I have a dream that there would be a traveling exhibit and they would let it, you know, come to Napa County for a time because I think it would be, you know, it really is a very special thing. And they're, um, you know, a very important local family. Um, Did you find any uh, evidence of women in the St. Lena Chinatown when you're looking through the census? I, no, I didn't, but I didn't get into, I was, you know, it's very hard to look up Chinese in those census records because, um, you know, their names could be spelled different ways. And a lot of times, even someone who you know is the same person, um, there isn't, you know, the, birth, the dates will be fuzzy. You know, they don't always give the consistent information. The names will be spelled differently. So the census records I did have, I just paged through the whole St. Helena census to find. So I would like to do that for, you know, later, I was mostly looking 1870s and 1880s when it was really big, you know, I'd really like to look at 1900, 1910, page through and see if we can find, I didn't find any, any women really, um, but you, so know, you can't, you can't look at the 1890 census. No, 1900 and 1910. Yeah, by 1900, things had really changed. Right. Uh, and, you know, um, there were, uh, two major fires in Chinatown. So by 1910 census, there wasn't much left. Um, but know. there still may have been Chinese, you know, I mean, we know there were some, but I'd like to see if there were a few families or, you know, just servants, you know, servants typically during that era you know, if you've seen Downton Abbey, it was the same all over. You were really not, you were really expected to not marry and have a family if you were, if you were a servant, you know, you, you lived with your employer and you were at their beck and call, you know, 24 seven. So, but yeah, I would, you know, it may be that there were women and they hid and didn't the census takers, you know, the women were officially discouraged and then they were often you know considered prostitutes whether they were or not um you know like we see that article where this 22 year old woman is the fourth wife of this 62 year old merchant so that wasn't really considered you know christian at the time and and you know being christian was kind of like the default, even though many people weren't religious, even in the 19th century. So, you know, that wasn't, there wasn't a lot of like respect for cultural differences around how families were uh, constructed. And so, you know, I mean, there was also actual prostitution in the community and, and coercion, you know, of women, but, um, you know, wives might also have been kind of unfairly suspected. So yeah, there weren't a lot of women and I think the ones there were maybe did not um, like to come out if they didn't have to. Um, so in, uh, in St. Lena, the, the reason that uh, so many laborers were attracted to, to come to St. Lena or you know, through a labor contractor found out they had work there. Initially it was um, excavating gravel from Sulphur Creek for the building of the railroad in 1868. And then of course, soon after the major vineyard development began. So um, what was the industry or what was the um, major need for labor in Napa uh, that began to make the Chinese population increase? You mean in city of Napa or in city of Napa? I mean, it, it's similar things, you know, you, you have to remember that the size of the city of Napa was, was smaller than St. Helena is today, you know, so there was a lot of farming right around Napa. So they were, um, they were definitely doing that. They were, they worked on road crews. Um, they had their own, you know, little stands. A lot of them, 
a lot of them are laundry men in early, you know, that was people did not do their, you know, men would not do their own laundry during that era, no matter what. And even, you know, if you were a married man, you know, if you had any needs at all, you would send the laundry out rather than have your, your wife do it. Of course, my ancestors did their own laundry because they were working class, but you know, if you had, if you were any kind of middle-class person, you'd send your laundry out. So, you know, it's really kind of shocking by today's standards when you see how many laundry men there are, but you know, like a, it would, a family, I, I'm, I'm sure you both know, and many people who would listen to this are aware that, you know, doing laundry was kind of like a three, it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I think you, you know, washed on Monday and then, you know, ironed uh, and everything had to be ironed because everything was, you know, wove. there were no knits. It was all woven cottons and they, everything had to be ironed. And then you, you know, there was something else you did on Wednesday with it. So it was really, and that was, you know, people wore the same thing all week. So laundry was really labor intensive. So a lot of them worked in laundry. Oh, um, later on in Napa, of course, there were the tanneries. And the tanneries employed, you know, that was, you know, people had to dip their hands in the chemicals and stuff. And um, that was pretty nasty work. And those crews were integrated. I have pictures of the the Sawyer tannery was sort of the biggest industrial operation in the the county. And they had white and Chinese workers and, you know, boys who were, you know, nine or 10 or 11. Um, they're all, all kinds of workers. So, um, you know, Napa had really all the industry so-called in the county and the river was really an industrial zone with multiple tannery, you know, leather was a very important export product of the county before um, the Clean Water Act made it so you, you know, couldn't just dump into the river all the time. So that that was an industry. And then, um, you know, like in Rutherford, I the pages and pages of miners and, you know, where, where exactly these mines were, I don't know. You know, there were a lot, there were quicksilver mines, of course, as as we all know, up, up in the you know eastern hills and, and up towards Lake County. But I think there were a lot of small, short-lived mining operations that didn't didn't go well. So, um, those so what was the, the the Bella Union um, mine at the end of Bella Oaks Lane? So they were mining up in the Western Hills as well. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, they really tried everything they could with the mining because they, you know, everybody hoped they would strike it rich. But yeah, so they they would be hired as miners and then, you know, hot pickers. But um, City of Napa, it was it was very similar. It was just a little little bigger and a little more industrial than than St. Helena. I have a question for both of you in your research over the years in this area. Um, have either of you run across any information on whether the Chinese workers had attempts at labor organization themselves? when they came under pressure, you know, with the whole anti-Chinese movement and people claiming, you know, the pretext was that they were trying to take jobs away. So was there any any um, activity on the part of the uh, Chinese laborers to organize? To my knowledge, nothing, you know, that would look like union building or labor organizing or kind of pushing back politically, but they, you know, they would, they would pick up and leave en masse and say, you know, fine, we'll leave sometimes and just, you know, vacate an area if things got too hot. And sometimes, you know, that could be seen as giving in, but it was also a punishment to the local economy because, you know, as, as most people I think are aware today, the, you know, the lowest paid workers are the ones who keep everything, everything going. And they, you know, even if they send money home, they, people who make less money 
spend what they make because they have to to get by where at you know so they would they would leave and then you know that labor source would be gone um and they would you know there were outbreaks of violence where they attempted to defend themselves or they you know went crazy and couldn't take it anymore and um attacked i did find uh i did find a reference to something um like that in um, 1887, there was a scarcity of, uh, of vineyard labor and uh, the whites were being paid $2 a day and the Chinese were being paid $1.25 a day. And some uh, of them got together and demanded $1.50 a day. Um, so I don't have any more details uh, on that uh, right here. But I mean that does show you they were trying to hold out for a better wage. Okay, there you go. So they were they were doing labor organizing. Um, there you know there's a lot of books. I don't know if you can see this, but this is this is a good one about this is you know it's very devastating to read because it's all about the anti Chinese movement and it's mostly um, I think it's mostly California and um, you know there's a lot of little. Um, you know tidbits from other places about um i found uh, two books that were useful uh, on this subject one of them was called beasts of the field mm. and the other one was called factories of the field factories Sorry, the i don't have the author's names okay. uh, here but i uh, i used those two sources um in my previous research on this topic Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's very challenging because the sources, you know, like I have the the old city county directory. I can't remember when it's from from 1910 or something that has all the photographs and it would be, you know, if only we had photographs of that, but those kind of booster oriented publications, whether they were or histories, they would kind of you know, because it was considered kind of like something we don't want to show because it's kind of messy and dilapidated. And so they just wouldn't, there wouldn't be pictures of that, you know, e even things like, you know, it's not just racial things, things like the um, health and human services, you know, that was the, the county poor farm, basically. Can't find any pictures of that either, because that's something people I think would rather have not talked about, you know. So it's a little frustrating the lack of uh, data in some respects. But that is a really exciting tidbit, Marion. That, that that must have taken quite some bravery to um, to uh, you know organize like that when you're under that kind of pressure. But um, of course, you know when you're making a dollar a day. It might it may be life or death to to make a dollar fifty a day, you know. And they were probably many of them were probably supporting twenty people in China, you know, sending sending money back and um, and was desperately needed. So, yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, um, any final questions, comments? Okay, well, um, just let me say thank you again, Kara. We really enjoyed it, and we hope our YouTube audience enjoys it. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to our channel, push the su subscribe button, and also ring the bell so you won't miss any of these lectures. And good night. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. Thank you. Enjoy it.